I'm deeply concerned about the false choices that Facebook presents. They routinely try to reduce the discussion to things like you can either have transparency or privacy. Which do you want to have? Mm -hmm. Or you can, uh, if you want safety, you have to have censorship. When in reality, they have lots of non-content based choices that would sliver off a half percentage point of growth, a, point, a percentage point of growth. And Facebook is unwilling to give up those slivers for our safety. And, um, and I came forward now because now is the most critical time to act. When we see something like an oil spill, that oil spill doesn't make it harder for a society to regulate oil companies. But right now, the failures of Facebook are making it harder for us to regulate Facebook. So on, on those failures, looking at the way mm -hmm. the platform is moderated today, do you think it, unless there is change, do you think it makes it more likely that, we'll, that we will see events like the insurrection in Washington on the 6th of January this year, more violent acts that have been driven by Facebook systems? Do you think we will, it's more likely we will see more of those events as things stand today? I, I, I have no doubt that the, chat, like the events we're seeing around the world, things like Myanmar and Ethiopia, those are the opening chapters because engagement-based ranking does two things. One, it pri prioritizes and amplifies divisive, polarizing, extreme content. And two, it concentrates it. And so if Facebook comes back and says, only a tiny sliver of content on our platform is hate, or only a tiny sliver is violence, one, they can't detect it very well, so I don't know if I trust those numbers. But two, it gets hyper-concentrated in 5% you know, of the population. And you only need 3% of the population on the streets to have a revolution, and that's dangerous. I want to ask you a bit about that, that, that hyper-concentration, sure. particularly an area that you worked on uh, in particular, and that's Facebook groups. I remember being told several years ago by a Facebook executive that the only way you could drive content through the platform is advertising. Mm. I think we see that is, that is not true, and groups are increasingly used to shape that experience. We talk a lot about the impact of um, algorithmic-based recommendation tools like Newsfeed. But to what extent do you think groups are shaping the experience for many people on Facebook? Groups play a huge and critical role in driving the experience on Facebook. Uh, when I worked on civic misinformation, this is like based on recollection, I don't have a document, but I, I believe it was something like 60% of the content in the Newsfeed was from groups. I think a thing that's important for this group to know is that Facebook has been trying to extend the number of sessions, like get you to consume longer sessions, more content. And the only way they can do that is by multiplying the content that already exists on the platform. And the way they do that is with things like groups and reshares. So if I put one post into a half million person group, that can go out to half a million people. And when combined with engagement-based ranking, that group might produce 500, 1,000 pieces of content a day, but only three get delivered. And if your algorithm is biased towards extreme polarizing divisive content, it's like viral variants. Those giant groups are producing lots and lots of pieces of content, and only the ones most likely to spread are the ones that go out. It was reported, I think, last year by the Wall Street Journal that 60% uh, of people that joined Facebook groups that shared extremist content and promoted extremist content did so, act, did so at Facebook's active recommendation. So this is clearly something Facebook is researching. What action is Facebook taking about groups that share extremist content? Um, I don't know the exact actions that have been taken in the last you know, six months, a uh, year. Um, actions regarding uh, extremist groups being <coughs> recommended actively to users, promoted to users, is a thing that Facebook shouldn't be able to just say, this is a hard problem, we're working on it. They should have to articulate, here's our five-point plan, and here's the data that would allow you to hold us accountable, because Facebook acting in a non-transparent, unaccountable way will just lead to more tragedies. Do you think that five-point plan exists? Uh, I, I don't know if they have a five-point plan. Or any plan? Do yeah, they, do they? I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I, I didn't work on that. Okay. But, it, but I mean, to what extent should we be considering groups? Or should a, reg, should a regulator, UK regulator, be asking these questions about Facebook groups? I mean, how, I mean, from what you're saying, they are a significant driver of engagement. And if engagement is part of the problem, the way Facebook have designed it, then groups must be a big part of that too. Groups, part of what is dangerous about groups is that uh, and, you know, we talk about sometimes this idea of uh, is, is this an individual problem or is this a societal problem? Uh, one of the things that happens in aggregate is the algorithms take people who have very mainstream interests and they push them towards extreme interests. You can be someone center left and you'll get pushed to radical left. You can be center right, you'll get pushed to radical right. You can be looking for healthy recipes, you'll get pushed to anorexia content. There are examples in Facebook's research of all this. One of the things that happens with groups and with networks of groups is that people see echo chambers that create social norms. So if I'm in a group that has lots of COVID misinformation 
And I see over and over again that if someone gives uh, COVID vaccine, uh, like uh, things they encourage people to get vaccinated, they get completely pounced upon. They get torn apart. I learn that certain ideas are acceptable and unacceptable. When that context is around hate, now you see a normalization of hate, a normalization of dehumanizing others, and that's what leads to violent incidents. I mean, many people would say that groups, particularly large groups, and some of these groups have hundreds of thousands of members in them, yes. you know, millions, they should be much easier for the platform to moderate because people are gathering in a, in a common place. Um, I strongly recommend that above a certain size group, they should be required to provide their own moderators and moderate every post. This would naturally, in a, a, a content agnostic way, regulate the impact of those large groups. Because if that group is actually valuable enough, they will have no trouble recruiting volunteers. But if that group is just a, an amplification point, like we see um, foreign inf information operations using groups like this and virality hacking, that's the practice of borrowing viral content from other places to build a group. We see these, these places as being, um, if you want to launch an advertising campaign with misinformation in it, we at least have a credit card to track you back. If you want to start a group and invite a thousand people every day, like the limit is I think 2,200 people you can invite every day, you can build out that group and your content will land in their newsfeed for a month and if they engage with any of it, it'll be considered a follow. And so things like that make them very, very dangerous and they drive outsized impact on the platform. So, I mean, from what you say, if, if, a, if a bad, bad actor or agency wanted to influence what a group of people on yes. Facebook would see, you'd probably set up Facebook groups to do that more than you would um, Facebook pages and, and run advertising. And that is definitely a strategy that's currently used by information operations. Another one that's used, which I think is quite dangerous, is you can create a new account and within five minutes go post into a million person group, right? There's no accountability. There's no trace, right? Uh, you can find a group to target any interest you want to. Very, very fine grain. Even if you removed micro-targeting from ads, people would micro-target via groups. And again, I mean, what, you know, what do you think the company's strategy is for dealing with this? Because again, there were, there were uh, changes made to Facebook groups, I think, in 2017, 2018, um, to create more of a community experience, I think Mark Zuckerberg said, which was good for engagement. But it would seem similar to changes to the way Newsfeed works in terms of the content that it, it prefers and favors. This is a, these are reforms the company have put in place that have been good for engagement, but have been terrible for harm. I think there's a, a we need to move away from having binary choices. There's a huge continuum of options that exist. Uh, coming in and saying, hey, groups that are under 1,000 people are wonderful. They create community. They create solidarity. They help with people with connection. <coughs> if you get above a certain size, maybe 10,000 people. Like, you need to start mo moderating that group because that alone, or get, that naturally rate limits it. And the thing that we need to think about is where do we add selective friction to these systems so that they are safe in every language? You don't need the AIs to find the bad content. Is, in your experience, is Facebook testing its systems all the time? Does Facebook experiment with the way its systems work around how you can increase engagement? And obviously, you know, in terms of uh, content on the news feed, we know it experimented around the election time, around the sort of news that should be favored. So, so how does Facebook work in, in, in experimenting with its tools? Facebook is continuously running many experiments in parallel on little slices of, of, the, of the data that they have. Um, I'm a strong proponent that Facebook should have to publish a feed of all the experiments they're running. They don't have to tell us what the experiment is, just an ID. And even just seeing the results data would allow us to establish patterns of behavior. Because the real thing we're seeing here is Facebook accepting little tiny uh, additions of harm, like when they weigh off how much harm is worth how much growth for us. Right now, we can't benchmark and say, oh, you're running all these experiments. Are you acting in the public good? But if we had that data, we could see patterns of behavior and see whether or not trends are occurring. You worked in the civic integrity team mm -hmm. at Facebook. So if you saw something that was concerning you, who would, who would you report to? This is a huge, uh, huge weak spot. Um, if I drove a bus in the United States, there would be a phone number in my break room that I could call that would say, did you see something that endangered public safety? Call this number. Some, 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 someone will take you seriously and listen to you in like the Department of Transportation. When I worked on counter espionage, I saw things where I was concerned about national security and I had no idea how to escalate those because I didn't have faith in my chain of command at that point. Like they had dissolved civic integrity. I didn't see that they would take that seriously. And we were told just to accept under resourcing. But I mean, you would, in theory, you would report to your line manager 
would, um, would it be then up to them whether they chose to escalate that? And I flagged repeatedly when I worked on civic integrity that I felt that critical teams were understaffed. And I was told at Facebook we accomplish uh, unimaginable things with far, your, far, far fewer resources than anyone would think possible. There is uh, a culture that lionizes kind of a startup ethic that is, in my opinion, irresponsible. Right? The idea that you know, the person who can figure out how to move the metric by cutting the most corners is good. And the reality is, it doesn't matter if Facebook is spending $14 billion on safety a year. If they should be spending $25 billion or $35 billion, that's the real question. And right now, there's no, there's no incentives internally that if, I, if you make noise saying, we need more help, like people will not, you will not get rallied around for help because everyone is, everyone is underwater. In many organizations that ultimately fail, I think that sort of culture exists. There's no, a culture where there's no external audit and people with inside the organization don't share problems with the people at the top. What do you think people like Mark Zuckerberg know about these things? I think it's important that all facts are viewed through a lens of interpretation. And there is a, a, a pattern across a lot of the people who run the company or senior leaders, which is this may be the only job they've ever had. Right, like Mark came in when he was 19 and he's still the CEO. There's a lot of other people who are VPs or directors who this is the only job they've ever had. And so there is a lack of, um, you know, the people who have been promoted or the people who, you know, could focus on the goals they were given and not necessarily the ones that asked questions around public safety. And I think there is a real thing that people are exposed to data <coughs> and then they say, look at all the good we're doing. Like, yes, that's true, but like we didn't invent hate. We didn't invent ethnic violence. And that's not the question. The question is, what is Facebook doing to amplify or, or expand hate? What is it doing to amplify or expand ethnic violence? You're right. I mean, Facebook didn't invent hate, but do you think it's making hate worse? Unquestionably, it's making hate worse. Thank you. Joining us remotely, uh, Jim Knight. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Francis, for uh, coming and, and talking to us. Um, first of all, just on some of that, that last fascinating discussion that you were having, um, if you, you talked about if you were calling out for help, you wouldn't necessarily get the resource. Would the same be true if you're working in PR or legal within Facebook? Um, I have never worked in PR or communication, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I do know that there is, um, I, I, was, I was shocked to hear recently that Facebook is, is wants to double down on the metaverse and that they're going to hire 10,000 engineers in Europe to work on the metaverse. Because I was like, wow, do you know what we could have done with safety if we'd had 10,000 more engineers? It would have been amazing. Um, I think there is a view inside the company that safety is a cost, a cost center. It's not a growth center, which I think is very...